Stroke is a devastating condition causing death and disability. There's a lot that we can do to prevent it um, and there's a lot that we can do once it's happened. So I'm Tony Rudd. Until um, earlier this year, I was a stroke physician at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London, uh, there 30 years. And for the last seven years, I was the National Clinical Director for Stroke with NHS England. A lot hasn't changed, but there's been a lot of change as well that's uh, um, particularly the introduction of new acute treatments like intravenous thrombolysis, thrombectomy, um, which makes it very important that these guidelines are now available for everyone to work with. So what I hope that this film will do will be to provide information primarily to primary care physicians, GPs, um, about how they should be recognising stroke initially, um, how they should be getting people into hospital. It's telling them a little bit about what happens in hospital because I think it's very important that general practitioners um, understand what their local services are and what they should be like. Um, and then particularly important where the role of the general practitioner is right at the forefront is in terms of managing the patient and their family um, once they're discharged from hospital, both in terms of um, supporting them their further recovery, but also making sure that they're on the optimal treatment to prevent further strokes. Stroke happens in the UK to about um, 85 to 90,000 uh, people each year who get admitted to hospital. 15% um, of those strokes are due to hemorrhage, primary intracerebral hemorrhage, and 85% due to blocked blood vessels causing infarction. 30% of your patients are going to get better regardless of what you do. They've got mild strokes, spontaneous recovery, and 10% approximately will die regardless of how good a quality of care you provide. So you're going to be left, even with the best service, with over half of your patients who need longer term care and support, both initially in hospital, in the stroke unit and from the rehabilitation team, back out in the community, um, because recovery can continue for months or years after the stroke. The presentation of stroke most frequently um, is picked up using the FAST, face, arm, speech, and most people will probably be familiar with that if there's weakness of one side of the face, if there's some slurring of speech or difficulty finding words, if the arm is weak. Um, that indicates that stroke is very likely. Um, and under those circumstances, um, whoever sees the patient first in primary care needs to get that patient to hospital straight away. In some unusual presentations, like for example, um, suddenly being unaware of feeling down one side, or very odd disturbance of vision, or, or thinking patterns, could be stroke. Don't bother taking a detailed history. Don't bother doing a detailed examination. Don't worry about every single little thing that that the hospital doctor might want to know, just dial 999, get that patient to the hospital and let them sort it out. My advice if you think it's a stroke is to not give them aspirin. 15% of the patients will have primary and cerebral hemorrhage um, and the aspirin could do harm. Once they arrive in hospital, in a well-organized department, they should be met by the stroke team, that might be a stroke nurse, it might be the consultant or a registrar, but part of a specialist team at the front door. Um, taking the basic history, taking, doing a very brief examination uh, and getting the patient to a scanner. And a scan is essential because you cannot clinically differentiate between a bleed and an infarct. And the treatments are obviously very different for the two. Then the scan will be interpreted and when I was looking after patients I would be in the scanner with the patient looking at the images as they came out and I would at that point make a decision about whether that patient might be suitable for intravenous thrombolysis with alteplase or uh, potentially suitable for thrombectomy. For thrombolysis, intravenous thrombolysis, the, that has to be given within a maximum of four and a half hours, but if you can give the treatment um, after two hours after the onset, it's much, much more likely to be effective. Maybe up to 20% of people are suitable for intravenous thrombolysis. 
If the patient might be suitable for thrombectomy, then you're going to need to involve an anaesthetist, an interventional neuroradiologist. Um, and those currently in England, um, the only places we do thrombectomy are in the neuroscience centres. So it may be that the patient will need to be transferred from their local hospital at that point to a thrombectomy centre. About 10% will be suitable for thrombectomy. It's a highly effective treatment compared to many other medical treatments. For those patients who are not suitable, and that's actually the majority, then getting them onto a specialist stroke unit where they're being looked after by enough nurses with the expertise, enough doctors with the right equipment can again make a really big difference to whether that patient ends up with disability or ends up dead um, or whether they become independent and go home. On a stroke unit, the key things actually are to make sure that you maintain the normal homeostasis of the patient. You make sure that their blood pressure is well controlled, not going too high, not going too low. You make sure that they are well hydrated. Many patients after a stroke will have difficulty swallowing or have difficulty reaching out perhaps for a cup to be able to drink themselves. So they're very prone to dehydration. Maintaining nutrition, again, if they have difficulties swallowing, they're going to need a modified diet. They need to be recognized if they are having difficulties swallowing. Um, and in the past, we used to have very high rates of uh, aspiration pneumonia. But if you have put into place the standards that the NICE guidelines recommend, which is that patients should have their swallow assessed as soon as they come into hospital, um, that can reduce the risk of aspiration pneumonia. It's around preventing complications from happening. So we talked about the pneumonia, but DVT, venous thromboembolism, very common after stroke. And we know that if you put on intermittent pneumatic compression devices, you can reduce that quite dramatically and, and reduce deaths actually from venous thrombo thromboembolism. Preventing depression by being positive with the patient, helping to explain to them what's happening and not leaving them isolated with a devastating disease is really critical. Preventing them from becoming contracted, so making sure that they're positioned in bed. The reason why stroke units work uh, in terms of reducing disability and reducing mortality very significantly is because of that team of people working as a collaborative um, all with a knowledge and understanding about stroke and an interest in it. In about two to five percent of patients, you can get massive swelling after a, an infarct called malignant middle cerebral artery syndrome. And under those circumstances, it's really important that they're recognized quickly and the pressure is reduced. And the only way you can effectively reduce pressure after a stroke um, is to remove part of the skull to allow the brain to expand um, out. Otherwise, the damage from the increased pressure within the brain is, will in most cases actually kill that patient. The other role for the surgeons is sometimes to remove blood clot after a primary and cerebral hemorrhage. The role of the GP after discharge is absolutely critical. It's not just the GP, it's the whole primary care team. Um, just like in hospital, we couldn't operate just as physicians on a stroke unit. We need the team of people around us. The same, I think, is true in the community. I think the first thing is that many people come out of hospital very confused about what has happened to them. And that's often, I think, not because the hospital team don't explain, um, but patients find it often difficult to retain information, understand it, um, during the acute phase of the illness. So giving information, helping to explain to people what treatment they have had and what treatment is going to be planned for the future is important. I think that helps to reduce anxiety. I think it helps reduce depression. And it certainly helps to ensure that the correct treatment is then given. About 50% of people will have a second stroke in the 10 years after their first one. 
Transient ischemic attack is really important for general practitioners to recognise. The definition, which everyone will be familiar with, is that it's neurological, focal neurological conditions presumed to be of vascular origin which have completely recovered within 24 hours. In fact, the majority of TIAs are fully recovered within an hour. So the likelihood of you seeing somebody as a general practitioner, if you called in to see them or they come in to see you in the surgery, is that there will be nothing to see. It's totally dependent upon the history. Really important to recognise them because the patient's at very high risk of going on and developing a stroke. In some patients, it's as high as 30% of people with a TIA will have a stroke within the next month. And the most likely time for them to have their stroke will be in the first few hours or days after the TIA. If the patient has made a full recovery by the time you see them, and all you have is the history that they developed transient weakness of an arm or loss of speech and you think this could be a TIA, that's the point at which you should be giving aspirin straight away as well as other secondary prevention measures like um, I would recommend giving a statin straight away, I would recommend um, monitoring their blood pressure and treating that if it's particularly high. Stroke is a treatable disease. These nice guidelines provide the framework to deliver that. We can only do it if we work together as a team, primary and secondary healthcare, to address the really complex long-term needs of many of our patients. I hope that you found the film useful. I hope that you will be motivated to look at the guidance and to use it on a daily basis when you need it. Thank you.